before we jump into our next one, I have a question to ask of all of you. How many of you ran here this morning? Oh, we have, okay, one person ran here. How many of you rode your bike here this morning? All right, here. I would like to introduce two people who, uh, one who ran and one who rode his bike here. Um, this is the team from Pole to Paris. Um, they've been on a really extraordinary journey uh, over the last many uh, weeks and months. So um, we have Daniel Price, who was on the southern route, and then um, Erland Mostuk Knudsen, who was on the northern route. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to these two, and then we'll have questions and answers from the audience. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan. And I'm Erlen. Um, we're just going to give a quick overview of what we've been doing over the last few months and then just open it up to questions because that's probably a, a better way to get more information from us. So, as was said, we are Pulled to Paris. This is an uh, outreach project we started. Uh, we thought about, well, actually, uh, soon last fall, but way before that, we met uh, four years ago in Svalbard. Svalbard, an archipelago high up north in the Arctic, uh, we were both taking part in a summer school. Uh, Dan, uh, he was uh, starting his PhD on Antarctic sea ice. I was starting my PhD on Arctic sea ice. And uh, so we shared both uh, scientific interest, but also very much the interest of different adventures. So we kept in touch. And uh, last fall, I got a Scott call from Dan. Yeah, so as Ellen said, we're both uh, have PhDs in climate science. He studies in the Arctic, I study in the Antarctic. And over the last decade that we've been studying, we're just becoming increasingly frustrated with the lack of action on climate change. Um, and we wanted to try and attempt a new narrative to engage people um, because it's such an abstract issue. Um, we thought that maybe journeys across the world would, would help to achieve that. So. I started on a journey from the Antarctic. I was down there on field work. Um, we were looking into improving estimates of how fast the ice sheets are moving off the continent into the ocean to improve estimates of sea level rise. Um, so I came back from the Antarctic and cycled from New Zealand to Paris while Erland has been running from the Arctic from Tromso. So I Skyped him when I got, I got back to New Zealand and wasn't really expecting a positive answer for him to commit to this, but he, he certainly was, and he'd been sitting on the other side of the world having the very similar thoughts that I'd had, just absolute frustration, and that sitting in our offices wasn't really enough in communicating the issue of climate change. So we started this campaign back in April. Um, so I started cycling from New Zealand, I came through Australia, up into Indonesia, into Southeast Asia, to Bangladesh, into China, across Russia, into Europe, and into Paris. And at the same time, I started early August uh, running from Tromsø, the capital of the Arctic. Along the way, that was 2,500 kilometers of running, carrying only my backpack. Uh, we, as, uh, as we said, this is a climate outreach project. We're not, we don't want to have any uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to what we're doing. So, of course, I didn't have a following car. That meant carrying a lot of my, on my back, um, but I also had so many wonderful experiences along the way. And most importantly, we met so extremely many passionate people. People that see climate change firsthand, they experience it, they have so many stories of it. They hear our politicians talking about it, but unfortunately, they see way too little change when it comes to act on climate. This year, right here, we have a great chance of taking a big step in the right direction. This is what led us into being so crazy as to run and bike across half the globe to spread awareness about climate change and the opportunities we have now at COP21. Exactly, and as Ellen said, this, this is our last chance. And again, since COP21's kicked off, things have seemed to be getting distracted away from, from the scientific fact that we have run out of time. Um, so this whole project was about communicating that urgency and trying to bring a, a new message in, in the form of people we met on the way and, and the, the journeys to engage people. So I think the best way to uh, continue is to open up the floor to, to questions. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jenny Lee with Global Progress. I'm wondering, looking forward, what you think are the best ways to kind of 
there's so much conversation on these issues, the best way to break through to people to really get them to take action. Thanks. Yeah, um, I've been um, thinking about that every single day on this bike ride, just trying to think what else we can do beyond this. Um, and I think that the, the main thing that is missing in this entire problem is personal stories and making this relevant to people and getting the emotional side across. Um, and I think that's gonna become far more apparent as we come into the next few decades as the impacts of climate change become more apparent. Um, so finding a way to communicate those is, is gonna be a key way to inspire action. Um, and then uh, bite a lot across countries which are already heavily affected by climate change, in especially Southeast Asia, whereas I mainly went to Northwestern Europe. Uh, there, climate change is thought about something distant, distant in time and distant in geography. So very much trying to relate to it, as Dan said, uh, getting something they can relate to, whether that's uh, the fishing industry, uh, maybe that's for farming purposes, things like this is a great way to get people on board and kind of relate to it, which I think is a very fundamental way to get people interested in climate change. Great, we have a question over here. Hey there, guys. Uh, my name is Kyle Sundman. I'm a student from uh, University of Denver and here with Connor G as well. Uh, and not to be presumptuous, but I would assume you don't speak 17 different languages. Um, and so I'd be interested to know kind of how you communicated your message to people on your travels um, that wouldn't necessarily understand uh, the, the the language um, as it's traditionally spoken, I guess. I mean, that was easier for for Ellen because he was coming through Norway and then was through the UK and into into Belgium and France. We had translators in. Yes. Uh, so uh, on our team, so in addition to Dan and myself, we were ten different people and a lot of different helpers along the way. These people, so ten different people from nine different countries, uh, that helped a lot. Uh, for example, as Dan said, uh, from Bel uh, Brussels to Paris. I ran along with two Belgian girls. They spoke French, uh, which, so as you said, not all people in these two countries speak English, for example. Still, I, I also know five languages. I, sp I presented in four different languages along the way myself. I don't know French, unfortunately, but I had these two girls along. And yeah, for me, so like Ellen's saying, we have a great team behind the scenes supporting us on the way, all voluntary, no money involved, just passionate people. Um, so we had a guy that was from China who was back out in New Zealand who was setting up things with Chinese organizations through the way as I was going through there, so set up the contacts. And when I was giving talks through China, I had translators. Um, and the rest of the time, one of our, well, our main partner is UNDP, United Nations Development Program. And as I was moving through Southeast Asia uh, and up into Asia, um, I do events with them and they provide translators. Um, but on the road, it got pretty difficult because people are asking me to get these personal stories. Um, and I had to come back to them and say, you know, I can't interview someone in another language. So I was, uh, one time I was in the middle of the Gobi Desert um, and was getting messages on my phone still somehow, technology is everywhere, and saying, getting these personal messages. And I was with, the, with these herders in the desert, just uh, with the goats. Um, and it would have been so fantastic to be able to speak to them, but of course, it was, it was an issue for me to get, to get those personal stories when you're out in the sort of rural areas. But I mean, I spent a lot of my time coming through the cities um, and, and having the support of the UNDP, yeah. Could you communicate in a, in a way other than speaking? Could, would, I mean, visually, could you show, <laughs> did you have anything to show them? I mean, um, in that particular case, not really. I mean, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know really how, how do you communicate climate change with hand signals. Um, <laughs> No, it really was tricky for me, and, it, and it, it was difficult. I spent a lot of time in Bangladesh, too, and we actually are putting together a documentary on sea level rise there, um, and we had translators there. Um, so we spent a lot of time in the coastal areas, and that was a, an incredible journey for me to come from the Antarctic, this place that seems so far away to people, um, to where it will, I mean, the ice melting there seems just so abstract and distant. Um, to come to the front lines of the consequences of that in Bangladesh um, and, and meet the people who are really stuck with this problem and who have absolutely nothing to do with creating it. Um, so it was fantastic to be able to communicate with them with the translators, so yeah. Yes, uh, my name is John Fraser. I'm with the United Nations Association. I'm on their board in the state of Iowa. United States, thank you for what you're doing. 
Uh, my favorite comment that I hear, I'm going to say it now, I am not a scientist. <laughs> and so I have a tough time when I'm talking to, even though there are dinosaurs in Iowa, we have one or two deniers still. And they love to say, I'm not a scientist, but we've had lots of ice ages, so all this stuff about melting ice is just a fairy tale. Could you give me a 30 second primer that I can use when I respond to people like that? What's different about the melting ice at the North Pole and the South Pole as compared to the multiple ice ages so I can shut these people up when they uh, tell me that I'm full of it? I wish I had the ultimate uh, answer to that. Yeah. Um, normally what I say is that, yes, you're correct. We had ice ages before, we had climate changes before. What's special now is that this is going on in an alarming pace, much faster than ever before. For example, we're losing species in a pace that's 10,000 to 10,000 times as fast as a natural rate. And I mean, like we humans are pretty much adaptable, but not all the species we live, uh, we depend on. Um, so if there's anything, the pace is the really extreme part. Well, well t totally the pace and, and how that is going to completely disrupt the Earth life support system, but also the fact that we're causing it um, should, should present, you know, uh, the, the, the denialist debate seems to maybe now have gone beyond that we're causing it and they're trying to cause some uncertainty about how fast it's going to happen and uncertainty related to the modeling and the radiative forcing to the planet. But, I mean, the fact that we're causing it um, is, is, is now completely different to the historical ice ages and the geological past. Um, and as we are carrying on as we are with CO2 emissions, we're, we've, we've now shifted out of, completely out of the natural cycle. Um, so, and pe people have asked me that along the way, this, this whole idea that the climate's changed in the past, so why does it matter now? What a ridiculous statement. I mean, if anything, it's evidence for the fact that we should act because the climate is capable of completely transforming the surface of the planet, and it's happened in the past, we should be doing everything we can possibly do to slow it down now. Um, it's just the most stunted argument I've heard the entire way, and from these idiots for the last 10 years who've been slowing us down. So it's just ridiculous. If anything, the fact that climate has changed in the past and we have evidence of it and we know how the system works is, is, is absolute support for taking action on it. Thank you. And last question. Hi, uh, I'm with Upworthy, and I would just, although I understand the translation issue that you both had to deal with on the journey, I would love to hear each of your personal favorite, personal stories that you did encounter along the way. For, for me, I think the most striking story was when I met a Sami, uh, a reindeer. Um, she, she lived with a reindeer, her whole life who was uh, depending on the reindeer up in northern Norway, in the Arctic. Um, normally, the winter up there will freeze on from maybe from around October, stay cold until uh, April, May, March, April, and it will stay cold. You have uh, snow and so on. Now things are changing. The Arctic is warming more than twice as fast as the global average. So in these regions, you now suddenly have a bit of rainfall during the middle of the winter. When this refreezes, it creates ice layers. The reindeers are not able to dig through these ice layers through down to the food. And so she told me that a lot of the, the calves, they starved, or um, they, and she, they had to start buying food in the middle of winter, which is very expensive, very hard to keep this livelihood. So for me, it's like just one extreme example of how really climate change is already occurring and is already affecting people's life. And these stories are first and foremost told by people that live off the natural resources, because these, these people see the climate changes firsthand and it's, there's not like maybe, I don't know about you, but I, for example, live mainly in a city where I can go to the supermarket and get my food. Uh, I don't see these changes firsthand, but these people that actually live on the natural resources, they have important stories to tell. And this is what we will also talk about later today at Le Boucher at 1 p.m. Yeah, for me, uh, it, it comes back to Bangladesh again. Um, when I was uh, studying in my undergrad years ago, I remember one of my lecturers talking about sea level rise and, and the low level area of Bangladesh. So we've got 30 million people living in one meter of the ocean, vertical meter of the ocean in Bangladesh. Um, if we have continued inaction on climate change, we could see a meter sea level rise by the end of the century. Um, and I met a woman out there on the coast. We spent a lot of time in the coastal districts. Um, and it's, the Bangladeshi people are so wonderful, resilient, incredible people. 
so kind, generous, and they're on the front lines of this. Um, and I met one woman, and she was a wonderful woman, and she, she told me that she's terrified of the ocean. Um, she's already had to move, 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 uh, move home before. Uh, she has two young children, and she's 30 meters protected by an embankment from the Bay of Bengal. Um, and it was just, it's the danger there. I mean, these people just have nowhere to go when a cyclone comes. It's, it's, it's horrendous, really. Um, they, they've got these cyclone shelters that, that are, a couple hundred people could fit in there and they end up 5,000, 10,000 people go in there. Um, and it's just a horrendous situation. Um, and if we begin to see, well, we are seeing in, increased intensity and frequency of cyclones in the Bay of Bengal, but at the same time, the sea level rise brings more water into the area and storm surges are gonna be that much worse. Um, so it's these people that we have to speak for here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think so important to think about the individuals who make up the whole of the story. So um, please join me in thanking Dan and Ernan. Thank you. And I'm gonna Thank you.